So let's talk about like a few things. Let's ground ourselves in just one really simple idea. Okay? Just to keep us all on the same page. Let's just call a product a tool that helps people. And if you think about it, any product that you build probably fits like that definition somewhere or another. The game is a product because it's a tool that helps people have entertainment, right? Your phone is a product because it helps you do a plethora of activities like on a mobile device, right? So let's just go with this idea that a product is a tool that helps people, okay? So you get to this idea of minimum viable product, and I find that a lot of times the way that minimum viable product is described, it's described as a deliverable, right? But really, minimum viable product is a process. Right? It's a series of concepts that you follow in order to deliver the smallest version of a product that you possibly can as quickly as possible to get it in the hands of the people who need your product. Right? So sometimes what that can translate to, because the language is so plain, you can start having conversations at work where you're like, well, what's the MVP for this? What is the MVP? What is the MVP? Right? And you start thinking about minimizing like, the product in some way. The more effective thing you can do is think about who are we building this for? What are the problems that they need solved? Does this solve enough of the people's problems in order for us to release the product? That's viability, right? And it always comes down to who are you building this for? Right? We're building it for the users. Okay, which users? In what country? Of what demographic? What's their background? What's their age? What's their income? What's the problem that they need to have solved? For who? Right? It's always about who. So, here's something to think about. I check this statistic from time to time. Some days will probably be less true, but the last time I checked it, 42% of startups fail because they're a product in search of a solution, right? And think about any time if you've been a product manager, you aspire to be a product manager, you think, oh, I got a great idea for a product, but you start with the product first. Is anyone familiar with the company Juicero? Juicero was a $1 billion capitalized company in Silicon Valley that wanted to build the best juicer in the world. They got about $100 million in startup money. And they said, we're going to build the best juicer in the world. And they started to take on a variety of problems based on input from the marketing team, the CEO, and the investors, et cetera. And what started to happen to Juicero was they started off with this really simple idea that like, for people who want juice, we're going to build the best juicer possible. And they started to come up with definitions of what the best juicer possible means. So they never really had a good sense of like a particular persona. They had a sense of a lot of different sort of personas that they thought about. And then those all got gone together into a conglomerated persona of someone who didn't want to deal with messy cleanup of their juice, who didn't want to uh, have to buy recipes like for juice themselves, who didn't want to have to go to the store and buy like products like in any sort of way, right? And then they started to get this idea across like the investment scenario that, oh, you know what? <laughs> it's not just enough to build a juicer. What we really want to do is build a juice platform, right? We want to build a platform so that we can own the juice industry itself. And so the way that we can build a platform is that we can own the end-to-end -end life cycle of creating juice. So how do we solve all of these problems? What we do is, is we take the juice and we actually, you know what? It's probably better the way that we can remove the messiness of even creating juice in the first place is that you, you pre-pulp the material and you put it into bags like for people. And so then we can create like all the recipes, we remove the need like for creating like a mess, and so then we can focus on the juicer itself and then we can make the juicer hyper-efficient by making sure that it presses all of the juice out of the bag. 95% of the juice out of the bag was not enough. 96% was not enough. They tooled a juicer product that would squeeze as much, as close as possible to 100%, 99.9% efficiency at squeezing these bags that they came up with and getting all of the juice out. Right? That juicer, when it was launched in the market, retailed for approximately $1,000. And when the product was introduced to people through reviews, the very first thing that most of the product reporters did at that point, sort of technology reporters, what they did was is they took the bags 
and they just squeezed it into a glass. And they said, yeah, they got most of the juice out. And that was good enough for people. And then theoretically, maybe the bag was something that was worth buying, but most of the money for Juicero actually was in the juice device itself. It wasn't in the bags. They intended actually the juice bags to be a loss leader, like the product itself. Within one year, this company that was capitalized by the likes of Google and all sorts of places like the Silicon Valley had disappeared because they had this idea that they wanted to build the best juicer, but they weren't exactly sure for who. And in the end, they didn't really build a juicer. They built a very expensive squeeze box machine that nobody actually knew. 42% of startups fail because they have a product in search of a solution. Or they have a product in search of a problem. So let's ground ourselves in a fun experiment. When we start thinking about just a persona, just a person who needs help doing like some kind of activity. I'm going to walk you through some product thinking, which is hopefully familiar to some folks in the room, but if it's not, it's a good exercise for you to, to think about this. We're going to look at someone who has a problem and see if we can think about a solution for this person. And everything about this is going to give you the framework to understand why viability is the most important thing when you're thinking about new viable products. So we have Olaf here, frozen. So what's Olaf's problem here? Olaf's problem that we're gonna work on <coughs> for right now is that Olaf needs to screw this into a board, okay? So let's think about Olaf as a persona, right? Olaf's very handy, likes to help people, right? Olaf has very weak grip strength because Olaf's arms and wrists and hands are literally like a tree branch. It wouldn't take very much for that to break. Okay? Olaf has a very do-it-yourself mindset. He's always trying to figure out like how do I help people like on my own. Olaf probably owns zero tools because Olaf doesn't own any clothes. Right? So Olaf needs to screw a screw into a board. Okay? Now theoretically, if you focus on the minimum, you probably wouldn't build something that's viable for all off. So here's the viability principle, right? Minimum and viable are almost synonyms in the context of good product management. Because in order for a product to truly be minimum, it has to be viable. The product is not viable, it's actually not minimum at that point because it's not useful for something. In order for a product to be truly minimum, it needs to be viable. In order for a product to be viable, you have to solve the fundamental problem that the user, that the customer, that the person has to begin with. And if you have solved that problem, what you end up with is, is a useful tool for someone. In a particular case, this particular persona, this person that we're thinking about here. Right? Therefore, a minimum viable product equals a useful tool for people. So here's another too long and didn't read. Okay. If you really want to understand how to build a viable product, understanding the people that you're trying to build a product for is really the only path to viability. You have to understand their needs and go beyond even just thinking of a conglomerate group of people. You really need to hone in on the persona or personas that you're thinking about solving a problem for in the first place. Okay, so let's go back to Olaf. Olaf needs to screw and unscrew boards, right? Handy, weak grip strength, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, I think the way that some organizations, some product managers, some engineers can start to think of minimum viable product is you just think about, well, what's the smallest version of the product that we can build that solves the very first use case, right? So in theory, if all you're trying to do is turn a screw, you just need a bit that goes into the screwdriver, right? So in theory, that's MVP1, right? Yep, okay, we solved it. We've got the thing that fits into the screw, and you know, if you have enough grip strength, you can turn it, right? Does this actually solve Olaf's problem? Absolutely not. Olaf, if he tried to actually squeeze like that bit and turn it, Olaf would most likely break his wrist, right? Raise your hand if you could take the bit of a screwdriver, put it into a screw and just turn it and actually make it work, right? Most people know you can't do that, right? 
Now think about any situation you've been in where you've made a version of this case to someone and then the reaction to the people you're working with is, okay, well, clearly we don't have enough features. Let's just build everything that we possibly need. You know, you want it to be you know, real feature rich? Let's build two different types of grips. Let's get like every top possible solution that we need, like for different screw solutions that we need at this point, right? So you make something that's very feature rich, that's got all kinds of things that would definitely violate the idea of like a minimum product at this point. But this is an illusion. Does this solve Olaf's problem? If you're building a screwdriver for Olaf, does Olaf even have the grip strength to grab one of these screwdriver handles and turn it? Chances are probably no. Most likely Olaf would still break the wrist at this point. Right? So let's go back to what we're trying to do. Olaf has very weak grip strength, has arms that are literally twigs that could break simply by a turning action possibly, right? It's very handy, wants to be self-sufficient, wants to be able to turn like these screws like on their own, right? So if you're trying to understand the people that you're trying to help in the first place, you start to see that, well, the small bit, that doesn't really make any sense. And this very feature galore sort of version of this, like where we have all these different screwdriver grips and different handles and different even sorts of bit lengths at this point, right? That doesn't really cut it either. For Olaf, Olaf probably needs a power screwdriver. Right? In theory, Olaf has enough strength to hold that. And that would probably solve the problem of, of Olaf like breaking their wrist if they tried to use the product at this point, right? In theory, what we just did is we violated every principle of minimum viable product thinking. But did we? If this is the smallest version of the product that's going to work for Olaf, it's really the only viable version of the product that's going to work for Olaf. And yeah, it's more complicated than a screwdriver with a handle, but it's literally the only one that Olaf can use. To put this another way, we used Olaf the snowman. Raise your hand if you know somebody that's 80 years old or older that has arthritis. Yeah. If you know anybody that's, that's that age, Power screwdriver is most likely the only thing that they can use like in their house in order to still be handy. Right. So, real simple idea, right? If you understand the person or the type of people that you're trying to build a product for, you're going to build something that they actually can use. And if you don't understand the people that you're trying to build a product for, no matter how many features you add or subtract from it, you're probably not going to give them something that's going to solve their problem. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the Fisher Space Man. Okay. Let's go back to the story again real quick. When NASA first started sending up astronauts, they quickly discovered that ballpoint pens would not work in zero gravity. To combat the problem, NASA spent a decade and $12 billion to develop a pen that works in zero gravity. Sometimes the story is $1 billion. Upside down, underwater, and almost on any surface, including glass and the temperatures ranging from below freezing to 300 degrees Celsius. And the Russians used a pencil. <laughs> See, that's minimum viable product thinking. That is the opposite of minimum viable product thinking. Let's think about an astronaut. What is life like for any astronaut or cosmonaut or typonaut? People that have to go into space. Okay. When you're talking about a pen, something that they can write on. That's a significant problem for a person in space. And let's even go back further. Let's think about the 1950s and the 1960s, when the space capsules that the United States and the Soviet Union were sending up had less power than the calculators that you most likely used in college. Definitely less power than everyone's phone in here right now. A lot of the work that you had to do as an astronaut was stay awake, stay alive, listen to instructions, and then sometimes do calculations by hand in space. So sometimes you had to write instructions down from people at mission control, because if you didn't write the instruction down correctly, you could die. You have to 
especially make sure that you do the orbital trajectory calculations correctly because you're going to have to then go to a machine that we're used to thinking of computers as these things that you type on with a keyboard or as something that you maybe see like on Star Trek where you kind of enter in a few disintermediated commands and the ship goes in the direction that you want it to. A lot of the older space capsules, the way that they worked was you had a, a giant wall of switches and you had to throw the switches in a particular order in order to make sure that the ship went the direction or did the thing that you expected it to do. So a lot of the work that you did was things like uh, trigonometry and calculus in space with a slide ruler based on orbital trajectory calculations that you get that you then have to disintermediate into the actual trajectory values that you get that you then have to plug into this computer that you have to sometimes flip 12 switches on before you actually enter the data. Like that, right? And remember, as we all know, as the engineers explained to us, Ballpoint pens don't work in space because gravity says is required for ink to flow. So ink will not flow up in space. The environment for an astronaut is also incredibly fragile. Right? I'm going to tell you a sad story. I'm sorry about that. Is anyone familiar with the story of Apollo 1? Yeah. Apollo 1 was the first ready capsule and rocket assembly to go to the moon. And before we got to Apollo 11, there was a series of tests that NASA performed where they, they staged different launches of these rockets in order to test different pieces of the equipment and their scenarios. And so the astronauts of Apollo 1 were testing the rocket takeoff itself and some of the safety equipment on there. And at that point, Everyone in the space industry had been flooding their cabins with 100% pure oxygen environments. 100% pure oxygen is not what we breathe, by the way. 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. A 100% oxygen environment is like very high pressure, but it's also incredibly flammable. And no one knows exactly what caused the spark in Apollo 1, but a spark went off like in the capsule, and the capsule was set on fire and the astronauts burned to death on the uh, before launch. They weren't able to escape from the capsule either because the pressurized environment prevented them from even opening the door. So the sad part of this is that three people lost their lives because of a lack of imagination about what could potentially kill people. Also, a lack of testing of preconceived notions about what you need to do in order to go into space to begin with because Americans and Russians have been sending people into the upper atmosphere for a couple of decades, like by that point. Well, a decade and a half. The good thing about that, though, is the outcome of that was increased safety. They got away from the 100% oxygen environment. They included explosive bolts, like in the doors of themselves, to make it easier for people to even escape, like from the capsules to begin with. But the point of this is that the environment is incredibly fragile. Right? If you're up in space, a hole the size of a pinprick could be enough to potentially kill you in space because that could be enough to leak all the oxygen out of the environment, right? Now, so far, I'm hopeful that I haven't really blown your mind with any information about what life is like as an astronaut. In fact, arguably, if you thought about it, I think anybody in this room could probably work out most of the detail that I talked about. You maybe have to be a little bit of a nasty geek to the Apollo 1 story. But the rest of it, probably can work out on your own. Just think about what is life like for an astronaut? Why are they wearing a space suit? Because they need that to breathe. Because there's no pressure in space. The environment is very fragile. And I think the other thing you can really think about is that there's very little margin for error. Right? One more sad story. I'm so sorry. The loss of the Columbia one of the last like, shuttle launches, decade, or decade plus ago, right? During launch, a tile fell off of the shuttle and banged into the joint of the wing of the Columbia. And it happened while they were in ascent like, to orbit. NASA knew, a manager there didn't think it was that big of a deal because that had actually happened multiple times in the past, and they didn't, couldn't conceive a scenario where that could be catastrophic. Right? 
it turned out that that particular bang had put a small hole like in the wing of the shuttle. So that when the shuttle was coming back to Earth, that small hole turned into a blowtorch. Because as you come back through space, the spaceships get really hot. Have you ever seen like any space movie like Armageddon or anything like that? Have you seen like that red hot you know, like meteors or whatever that is? That's what happens, right? And so essentially that small hole turned into a blowtorch, and that's the thing that sheared the wing off of the shuttle and eventually caused it to break up, right? A thing that had happened all the time that was so insignificant because it had happened so often it turned out to be the thing that cost those astronauts like their lives, right? So what's the point of that? Well, the point of that wasn't to make anyone feel sad on a Wednesday. The point of that was just to emphasize that for astronauts, there's very little margin for error. And I go back to my earlier point that all of this stuff is stuff that you probably can work out, again, without knowing a deep history of NASA or being a geek. Orbital trajectories save your life. Writing down instructions like save your life. There's very little margin for error because the environment is so fragile. Okay. So let's think about what we've talked about as the MVP for a space pen. Right? Yeah, it's like all you need is a pencil, right? Just a wooden pencil would be plenty, like in space. Based on everything we just thought about, does that actually make any sense like at all? No. Why? It's a fire hazard. In order to sharpen the pencil, right, because the pencil lead can break, you've got to grind it inside a pencil sharpener, like somehow, or you have to use a knife and shave it down. So what do you end up with? You end up with little micro pieces of carbon and wood that can catch on fire, right? Think about something else, too. Small pencil lead breaks on Earth, what happens? It falls to the ground. Where did the pencil lead go? I don't know. A pencil lead breaks in space, it floats. So what can happen? The pencil lead is broken in space, but going to an astronaut's eye, what happens then? Oh, well, if I got pencil lead in my eye, I probably would get some visine and then maybe go to the doctor. You can't really do either of those things like when you're in space. So. What we, at the beginning, very smugly decided was the MVP for astronauts pretty clearly is potentially a death trap for those very same astronauts, right? Think about this too. Imagine that you're trying to write orbital trajectories and imagine any time you used a pencil that's newly sharpened and it breaks, right? You can resharpen it again. Now you're trying to talk to someone on the phone while you're writing down these orbital trajectories. You've maybe been up for 10 hours plus because in this very uncomfortable environment, can you really read the instructions that you're writing in the first place? The pencil fails at least three of the tests that we just talked about, about our astronaut persona, right? It doesn't solve the test of being uh, of accounting for very little margin for error because there's so many things that can go wrong with that just a little bit. Imagine that one of those little bits of wood fell behind one of these old circuit panels and then caused a short, right? You can blow out the circuit panel, have no replacement for it, and also potentially start a fire, right? It doesn't really account for the environment being like very fragile, like either. It does account for one thing. Theoretically, you can write down orbital trajectories. You can theoretically write down instructions with it. You also can solve the problem of, you know, ink not flowing out in space. I think what we pretty clearly defined here is that there is a non-zero possibility that what we thought called MVP-1 could literally kill an astronaut. Okay. Here's the thing that blows my mind. That both NASA and the Soviet Union used wooden pencils until 1968. Almost 20 years, right, they used like these wooden pencils. The Apollo 1 fire was one of the things that started to inspire NASA to think maybe a little bit different direction. Okay. The pencils that NASA used basically came in three flavors. The first flavor of pencil that was used was something that the astronauts often brought up themselves. They often brought up mechanical pencils. And they were warned, like, hey, if the lead breaks, it can fly into your eye. It's fine. 
So some of them would bring their own pencils up. Wooden pencils were also used, like on submissions. But then there were also like these special grease pencils that NASA used at the time to break the space. They didn't cause a fire hazard. They could be used like pretty easily. You could sh you know sharpen it without like too much effort. The grease inside of it lasted like for quite a while. Uh, the pencils cost in 1965 dollars 128 dollars and 84 cents. This actually created a scandal in 1965. When we think about the space program now, we have the legend of the United States space program filtered through the baby boom generation, who by and large were children and young adults when these programs were created. To them, the space program was this magnificent, amazing dream machine of what the future could look like for them. But for the adults, there's a lot of debate about whether we needed a space program. Some adults at that time thought that we needed a space program in order to fight the Soviet Union and you know, make sure that we had ballistic missile technology that was on par with theirs. Others just believed in the dream of space like itself, and others just thought it was a huge waste of money. We could be spending the money like in such better ways. So this pencil, $128, created a scandal in the Congress as people started to go through the line items for NASA's budget. Because up until that point, NASA had a pretty open budget for the things that they were trying to go for. At least part of that was driven by John F. Kennedy, who said that we can put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. So NASA put themselves to that task, and they ran into the forces of accounting. So along comes a guy named Paul C. Fisher. Paul Fisher made pens. He didn't work for NASA. He knew about the scandal, and he knew, like everybody did, that Ink doesn't flow in space. So how do you solve that problem? Fisher invests a million dollars of his own money and sets out to work himself. It comes up with the idea of a pressurized ink cartridge. You put a special cartridge like into a pen, and that cartridge will solve this problem of ink not flowing in space. You can write upside down with it, you can write it any direction. Okay. He files patents. 328228. The key point here is, is that NASA did not invest $12 million. They didn't invest $12. Fisher invested $1 million of his company's and his own money in 1965 to figure out this pen. He filed the patent in May of 1965, right at the height of the scandal about the $130 pencils. Used special ink, created a pressurized cartridge, new paradigm for the product, right? NASA spent two years testing this pen because they had gone through disaster. They had seen what something as innocuous as a 100% oxygen environment can do like to their astronauts. So the pen actually went through pretty rigorous testing. Fisher invests a million dollars of his money and has to wait two years to find out if one of his primary customers for the pen is even going to use it. Right? The beautiful thing about the Fisher Space Pen is that it solves every single problem for the astronauts, right? It can certainly write down orbital trajectories, it can certainly write down instructions. It definitely solves the no gravity problem. Heck, on Earth it works. If you ever use a Fisher Space Pen, they're kind of neat. You can always write upside down. It's usually the first trick that people show you if they have. But it also accounts for probably the two most important things. It accounts for the environment being fragile, and it accounts for there being little margin for error, because the pen is going to be guaranteed to work. As long as there's ink in the cartridge, you're fine. So MVP2, I think we can conclude, much as NASA did after two years of study, that yep, this pen will not kill an astronaut. Fisher charged $2.39 for those pens to NASA. That's about 400 of them. So it's about 100. 
you can read up on scientificamerican.com and also the history of NASA at spacepen.html to learn a little bit more about this. So he only sold 500 pens to both the US and Soviet space agencies. But the beautiful thing is that he made somewhere between $100 million to $300 million off of his patent, like since 1965. Because it was the public who was fascinated and found the glamour, like in the pen like itself, right? I always like to think about this case study because imagine if NASA, who in the present often runs into budget funding problems, had actually decided, yeah, we're going to build our own space pen. Maybe if they had invested a million of their own dollars or had bought the patent like Fisher to begin with, all the money from the space pens being sold could have just gone back into their programming to help keep it funded, fund it, right? Here's the end of the story. Because remember I said that 100% of the story was not true. And we kept working from the premise that you can't use a ballpoint pen in space. It turned out that in the entire history of the space program, no one had actually tested that principle or that premise until 2003. A Spanish astronaut went up to the International Space Station and he had a ballpoint pen with him because everyone had told him that you can't use a ballpoint pen in space, but he could find no studies, no evidence that that was true. He took a ballpoint pen with him up into space and he used it. It turned out, oh, ballpoint pens actually do work in space. <laughs> What's the point of this? It's twofold. Right? The first thing is, with respect to my colleagues in engineering and product engineering and design, if someone tells you very definitively this doesn't work or X is true. I think it's the right thing to do to believe like your technical experts, but I think the very next thing to do is to say, can you show me the test or can you show me the study that grounds like that principle? Maybe if literal rocket scientists <laughs> five decades ago had asked this question, none of this story that would be right? But I think the other thing is, whenever you hear any kind of scenario about a product that maybe sounds too good or too contrite to be true, just step back. Ask yourself, who are the people? What's the problem we're trying to solve? And most of the time, you'll be able to pierce through any kind of story that's trying to sell you.